What's up, everybody? This is Scorch the Fears with Abraham Gray. Abraham is a beast in Sub 2 and just in the universe. Another person, just Heston, who I had on last week, who is a big guy in Sub 2, and I just don't know him. So I was, man, I need to get him on the podcast and talk to him, see what he's doing, see what's happening in his life, his journey, all of that stuff, because I know he's doing awesome things. You had your business mastermind really recently, and I thought that was pretty cool. I couldn't go to it, but... This guy is incredible. I appreciate you so much for coming on, my man. Yeah, yeah. You had Keston last week. Keston, we hang out all the time. Yeah, he lives right near me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because where where do you live? I live in Atlanta, and he lives in Atlanta. So he, he actually lives five minutes from my office, so we, we hang out. Nice. Sometimes. You guys have some big people in Atlanta. You two, Eddie Charger. There's yeah. some good people. Yeah, Eddie in Charger comes here all the time. We got Alexis Morgan. We got uh, shit, ton of people. Yeah, it's just the list goes on. I love it. So real quick for the people that don't know you, just quickly introduce yourself, do an intro of what you're doing in business. I know you own tons of different businesses, what you're yeah. doing in real estate, all of that good stuff. Just give a quick introduction. Yeah. So I have been doing real estate since I was 22. I'm 48 this year. So a long time. And I've been doing business since I was 15. So I started my first business when I was 15. And I've really made most of my money in business, but I made a shit ton of money in real estate too. So uh, I do both. I love them both. And I'm always, you know, learning more, teaching people. And I do a lot of events. I speak at a lot of people's events. I have my own events. I actually paces at all my events now. The ones that I do, we're kind of doing them together a little bit more now. So since, uh, since the last one in February, he's going to start coming and being, you know, part of all, all the events. So it's kind of cool. People love hearing him talk. And then, yeah, we, you know, I teach people everything there is to know about business, how to find them, how to buy them, how to evaluate them, how to get the money for them, how to buy them creatively with none of your own money and, you know, very profitable businesses that you do very well with. And it's similar to what Pace teaches in real estate is kind of what I teach with business. And uh, yeah, I actually have some businesses with Pace. I, I actually just, just got a business with Jamil. So I'm partners with Jamil on, on a, on a yeah. business. And then, you know, of course, Pace, we, we have that deal, no deal where we buy properties all over the country with people. Love it. I love it so much. So let's go way back then. Cause there are certain people, this is, I am curious because there are just certain people that I'm so intrigued by starting, starting your first business when you're 15. Do you feel like you were just kind of born with that? Do you feel like that was born in you? Do you feel like your parents were entrepreneurs? I didn't even live with, I didn't so, even yeah. with my parents. I didn't even live with my parents. I, I literally live, my parents got divorced when I was one or two years old. And I lived with my mom for a little while, then my dad for a little while, but didn't work out. And I really went from foster family to foster family and went to a boarding school for a while and then back to foster families. And then I ended up moving with my grandmother. But I, my parents weren't at all entrepreneurs. I just, I collected sports cards my whole life. And then literally when I turned 15, I started selling them and that's kind of how it, how it all happened. I got really good at it. I started making more and more money and I got better and that just turned into other businesses as, as I got older. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it basically gave me my freedom. You know, when I had to rely on other people for stuff, it sucked, you know, cause I can only get what I could get people to give me. Once I was starting to make my own money, I could do whatever I want. Right. I mean, I love it. I mean, the financial freedom, it makes total sense. I mean, this question might not even relate to you. I'm not sure. Did you have any fears when you were going into business? Were you dealing with things when you, let's start with the 15 and then we'll get into real estate. But yeah. when you were 15, were you dealing with any fears of failure or was it more just small time stuff or were there any fears at all? I'm just curious. Yeah, I think everybody has fears. I mean, I think people that tell you they've never had fears is bullshit. You know, anytime you do something that you haven't done before, or anytime you do something that you're not great at yet, you're, you're going to be careful because you're fearful of failing. You're fearful of losing whatever you put into it. You're fearful of people around you seeing that you failed and, you know, looking like idiot to your friends. So there's always that fear, but you know, once you get into something and you start doing it, the fear kind of goes away. Gotcha. Talk about that. What do you mean? Once you start getting into it, the fear goes away. What do you, what do you mean? Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of fearful when you first start doing something, but once you're doing it, you're, you know what? I could do this, you know, and once you have confidence in yourself, that's when the fear goes away. So you're always fearful right before you start because you don't know if you're going to be good at it. But once you see that you're doing it and you know, you're still alive and everything's fine, the fear just goes away. I get it. Yeah. Think about it the first time, the first time you did a podcast, 
you were probably a little bit nervous, a little bit fearful when you first did your first one. And now every single one, you're less fearful. And now you're probably, oh, it's nothing. So it's the same thing. Anytime you do something in the beginning, you're fearful because you don't know if people are going to you. You don't know if you're going to sound like an idiot. You just don't know. And you don't know if people are going to watch you. And that's fearful, you know, because you don't want to look like an idiot. That's true. I definitely get that. I mean, definitely when I did my first podcast, it was, I feel way more comfortable now. I don't know if I was ever afraid of podcasts because I was just, I done already so many other crazy things, but mm -hmm. I definitely remember being, I feel way more comfortable with this. Yeah. This is just part of my week now. Instead exactly. of before it was like, whoa, this, look at this whole new thing. How do I make this work? Right. So what do you say to those people who are fearful at the beginning where they're, Hey, Abraham, I don't want to lose 20 K on a flip, or I don't, what if I can't make this whole thing sailing work and I spend 10 K on marketing or whatever it might be. What do you, what do you say to people who are it's newer? Very, it's very simple. It's very simple. Groups? So you basically t take the risk and reward of everything and you have to, you know, balance it out. Is the risk we worth the possible reward? What's the, what's the worst thing that could happen? What's the best thing that could happen? Can I afford the worst thing to happen? If the worst thing that happens, I'm going to die, then maybe you don't want to do it. If the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to lose a certain amount of money, but you know it'll hurt you, but you can still overcome it. But the upside is so great that it's worth doing. Then then go for it. You know, obviously the other thing is you know if you're super fearful to do it on your own, find someone that's already done whatever you're trying to do, and maybe do it with them in the beginning. And then once you do it with them, you, you have that confidence that they know what they're doing. And then eventually, once you start doing it with them and you get better at it, then do it yourself. Love it. No, that totally makes sense. I mean, I feel that definitely, especially in business is just seeing somebody else doing and getting a mentor mm -hmm. is so freaking key. I mean, mine was Pace, right? He was my first, I mean, my first one was Jamil. I actually joined Astro and then I, and then I got J Jamil as my, or sorry, Pace as my second mentor. And they're my two main mentors to this I'm an day. Astro I'm an Astro flipping in and Anderson too. Oh, I love it. Awesome. So so talk about mentors for a second. Who were your mentors? Did you have any mentors when you were 15? Oh, when did you think, find out about everybody mentors? has to have some sort of mentors? You know, you might not think of them as mentors, but they're definitely mentors. I mean, a mentor is someone that, that guides you in life, that helps you, that teaches you stuff that, you know, fast forwards you to, you know, getting better, faster without having to learn it for yourself. Everybody has those types of people. So in the beginning, you know, my mentors were, you know, just good friends that I had that were older than me, you know, I had friends that were 20 years older than me that's been through stuff. And, you know, I had rough, a rough childhood, a rough life. So they would, you know, take me to the ice cream store, or take me to the park and we would talk and, you know, they, they gave me wisdom at that age. I didn't know a lot of stuff and that's, that's how I learned. So those were my mentors, you know, and then, you know, getting into paid mentors, right. Cause there's paid mentors or non-paid mentors. When you get the paid mentors, I bought some different programs in my teenage years. You know, I bought a Carlton Sheets program, which is, he was a creative finance real estate guy back, you know, back in the eighties and nineties. Hmm. I started with him and I learned from him and I bought, you know, some no money down properties back, back in, in the nineties after I, I bought his program. And then, you know, I've been doing sub twos and owner finance stuff since, you know, probably really, really early two thousands. And a lot of it I learned, I learned from him. And then, you know, I, I did one or two deals every couple of years. And then, you know, I, I continued that up until I, I bought sub two. And when I joined Paces, now I'm doing two or three sub two deals a week. <laughs> you know, I was right. doing that many every year or two. So, you know, I, I didn't know that it was a real thing that people did it that much until I got into Paces program. And now I see, oh, it's a normal thing. So now, you know, he got me aggressive to do his, you know, a lot more. Gotcha. So how... What would you say, because I, I feel, at least for me, I never had it where I had mentors growing up that kind of naturally happened, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely as I was growing up. But then when I wanted to get into real estate, I mean, for me, I don't know. I just immediately jumped in. I was broke and I was just, all right, screw it. I'm going to spend 8K on Astro. Got one deal, immediately put that back into sub two. Best decision I've ever made in real estate oh, yeah. by far. But what do you, what do you say to people? Do you say, Hey, just buy one of their programs or what, what advice do you give to people yeah. when they're starting off? Should yeah, get I mean, a you, de you, de you definitely should. If you don't have the money to do it, then, you know, maybe you learn from other people, go to, go to local events, you know, join every Facebook group for whatever, if it's real estate, you know, join every or a local real estate Facebook group and, and learn that way and go to meetups and then do a deal. And as you, as you do a deal, then it reinvested into a program. So, you know, back after Carlton Sheets, the next program I bought was a Tony Robbins program. I think, you know, mindset's the most important thing. So 
if, if your mindset's shitty, then it doesn't even matter what, what program you buy because you're not going to have the confidence to do it. So yeah, I, I took some Tony Robbins stuff. I got you know really confident in myself. I believed in myself more and all that stuff. And yeah, fast forward to you know 2020. Yeah, I I bought you know a Paces program, and I knew I thought I knew almost as much as you could possibly know in real estate. And then you know I buy his program. Holy shit, you know there's so much more to learn. Literally crazy amount more I learned, and I learned more every single every single week. And, you know, I got your meals program, I have a bunch of other people's programs, but yeah, you always learn something. And no matter what you learn, everything you learn, you know, is worth 5,000, 10,000 on every single deal you do. So I've literally done hundreds of deals since I bought Pace's program, implementing a lot of his stuff, Jamil, same thing. So it's, if you're an action taker and you're going to do stuff, you literally have to do one deal and you make all your money back. And then you're going to do so many more because of it. So it's an infinite return. So I, I would definitely buy, but here's the thing. There's a lot of shitty programs out there. There's a lot of programs that cost a lot of money that aren't worth it. So you got to do your research and make sure you buy the best programs, you know, check reviews, you know, make, uh, talk to different people in the free Facebook groups, talk to some of your friends, see what they, see what they think is worth it. See what they think is, is overpriced. And, you know, don't just buy something without doing your research because then you could be throwing away money. But if you buy the right ones, you're going to get your money back a hundred times over. So let's talk about your journey a little bit. Cause I'm curious. So you start selling sports cards at 15. Yeah. How does that spur your journey into entrepreneurship? Where do you go? How do yeah. you start? Does it start getting into real estate? Does it get into other businesses? How does, what's your journey, man? Where does it start from that 15 year old kid to um, Abraham Gray today? So I was in baseball cards, you know, I, I basically when I was 15, I started, you know, toward the end of when I was 15, right before I was 16, I was making about a thousand dollars a week. This is back 1989, 1990. And I'm going to get an inflation calculator out real quick. Yeah, it's a lot, it was a lot more than what a thousand bucks is today. But then when I was, you know, 16, I started making a couple thousand dollars a week, you know, 17, a few thousand dollars, you know, three, 4,000 a week, 18, way more, 19, a shitload. And I was, I was living with my grandmother at the time because I moved after all these foster families, I moved in with my grandmother and that's how I ended up in Atlanta. So that's where she lived. I was in different States before that, but basically I, I didn't have any bills. You know, I, I, I bought a car. And all I had was, you know, insurance and gas. I didn't, you know, I lived with my grandmother, so I didn't have any rent. So I saved all my money or I mainly reinvested my money into more product. And I got really good. I knew what was worth buying. I knew how to negotiate. I knew how to, you know, do all that stuff. So I was just compounding my, the money I was making. And I was able to save a million dollars cash in my bank account when I was 19. So by the time yeah. I was 19, I had a million dollars saved. And then from, from there, basically what happened was in 1997, when I was in my early 20s, 21, 22, Beanie Babies became really popular. And I always thought I was going to do baseball cards my whole life, honestly. That's where I thought, you know, it was easy. It was fun. Wait, hold on, hold on. I got to interrupt you for a second. You did, you made a million dollars just flipping baseball cards for four years from 15 to 19? Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. That's yeah. wild. I just want you guys to know that's that's pretty sick. Especially, and this is pre-internet too. So no, no, there like, was internet. I actually did have, so there were, what, back in 1990s. There was early internet. There was early internet. I actually sold a lot of cards on Prodigy. That was the big internet, Prodigy. And there were there were actually boards for people buying and selling stuff. And so baseball cards was there. There was also other other stuff on the internet. It's crazy, but there was internet back in 1990s. But Interesting, it, okay. It, it was dial-on, it was slow as fuck, but it was there. <laughs> so, so I actually, that was one of the ways I was able to make a lot of money. I was one of the first ones that really hit the internet hard. Did you ever, ever have a deal going through, but then somebody then grandma starts calling on the phones or something like that and then got cut <laughs> off i'm just curious I, I had that with video games because yeah. i was i was very i, I, was I would like let her know like come that. on it but we didn't get that many calls but that would suck yeah that did suck i did get cut off i mean it wasn't as good as, as the internet is now it's crazy but yeah so what i would do is i would go and basically buy atlanta braves cars you know the falcons the hawks all, all the local the teams that people pay premiums for in atlanta were worthless everywhere else so i would just buy all the premium stuff and get it, you know, and I would trade my Dodger stuff and my, you know, Raiders and my whatever, if I was trading to LA or, if I, you know, my Minnesota, I would trade them on my twins player, my Kirby Puckett's and, you know, Kevin Garnett's and all that stuff. And basically it was worth five times more in those cities than it was in Atlanta. And then the Atlanta stuff was worth five. So we were able to get, you know, make, I was able to make so much money just by trading stuff that was worth more in Atlanta and worth more in other places and get a really good value. That's, that's why I made a lot of the money. And then I just knew how to buy stuff at a really good price. I was able to look through collections and, you know, thousands of cars and, and in five, 10 minutes, I could give someone a price for the whole thing, no matter how much money it was. I, I was just, I knew what stuff was worth. 
So, but yeah, that was back in the internet back in the, in the early nineties. And then, but in, in 1997, Beanie Babies became really, really popular. And I was at these baseball card shows and all of a sudden these women, these middle-aged women would set up with baseball, with Beanie Babies. And I was, what in the world are these people doing? I was making fun of them for the first few weeks. I saw them there. And then eventually I saw that their, their tables were lined up with people and more people than us at selling baseball cards at these baseball card shows. So, you know, I got really curious and I started walking over there talking to these ladies. What are, what are these things? Why are people buying them? All this, all this stuff. And they kind of explained it to me and I saw how much they were doing. I asked them how they got it, what it cost. And before you knew it, I was just going in and buying way more Beanie Babies than them and then taking them to baseball cards and selling them. And for like 1997, 1998, I, I started doing Beanie Babies and baseball cards. And then eventually you said, fuck baseball cards, even though I was making so much on them at this point. I was making so much more in Beanie Babies and uh, I just got a full time in the Beanie Babies for, for probably five years. And uh, I made my first million dollars in baseball cards. I made my first $10 million in Beanie Babies. So I made the 10 million in Beanie Babies in, uh, in a six, seven year period. Wait, can you quickly talk about what was this, right? What, what was the, how did you do that? It's a, you make it sound so easy. Was it literally you found a Beanie Baby at a garage sale or, uh, and then sell it online or what would it uh, be? So, well, so how old are you? I'm 28. So you don't really know Beanie Babies that much. I we had Beanie Babies. I just I was so young that I didn't I didn't yeah. I heard that there was a financial thing happening. Crazy Beanie Babies. 1997, 1998, 1999, even 2000. Those four years, people would kill people for Beanie Babies. It, it was the craziest thing. It made no sense. This okay. guy Ty Warner that came up with it, he could print as he could make as many as he wanted, and it was like printing gold. So Beanie Babies from the cost two dollars and fifty cents from Ty. He would sell them to these stores. And the stores would put them out for five or six bucks. They'd double their money a little bit more. However, he only sold them to mom and pop stores. So Hallmark stores, gift stores, some flower stores, really small stores. No big stores had them. You couldn't go to the Walmart or, or Target or grocery store or drugstore. None of those places would have it. He wouldn't sell them. He wanted it to be super, super, you know, limited. So, but he'd come out with new ones all the time and retire the old ones. And that, and they became valuable because they retired. You can't get them anymore. So Beanie Babies in 1997, the cheapest Beanie Baby that, that existed was $10. If you, eBay was around, right? eBay was really popular. And mm -hmm. you could put any Beanie Baby on, on, on eBay and you'd get $10 up to, you know, hundreds of dollars if it was something that was really rare. But the most common ones that you'd find in stores were worth 10 to 25 bucks. So I would go around to every single store that had that sold Beanie Babies and buy every single one that they would let me buy. They had limits on them, but I had ways around it. And I, I, you know, I paid full price, six bucks or five bucks. And then I'd take them to the show, sell them for you know, 10, 12 bucks, 15 bucks. The good ones I'd get a lot more for. And it was just so easy because it was a commodity and it was worth what it was wow. worth because eBay said that's what it was worth. And if you put it on there, it'll sell it. And I got really good. So I made a list of every single store in my, in, in Atlanta that sold Beanie Babies. And I would call every single one every day because they get a shipment once a month. Did you get your shipment? Did you get your shipment? And I paid people to do it. And as soon as someone said they got their shipment in, I would be the first one there. And uh, if there were lines, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd bring, I'd go in the line and a lot of, a lot of stores only let you get three or five or whatever. I would just bring 20 friends with me and everyone would buy five. And, you know, I, I was able to buy a quantity. And then what happened was I got really close with a lot of the store owners, a lot of the managers and workers. I'm like, look, you're selling these for five, six bucks. Why don't you call me and I'll give you seven bucks or eight bucks and I'll just buy everyone you have. And then. You could buy them for retail on your own store if it was a manager and you could sell them all to me and you know, you're going to make a lot more money that way. And, and anyhow, eventually I was able to work deals with different people, different owners, different stores, and just get big quantities of them. And that's where the money is in big quantities. So I was buying hundreds at a time and thousands at a time. And eventually back in 1998, 99, I got like really close with a lot of owners and managers that had a lot of stores and I was just buying thousands, tens of thousands of these at a time off people. And uh, I was able to, to sell them by the truckload too. So the reason why Beanie Babies, everybody wanted Beanie Babies, Walmarts and, and Targets and drugstores and grocery stores was because everybody was looking for Beanie Babies. So if they can get Beanie Babies in their store, people will come shop in their stores and buy other stuff. Hmm. So I had drugstores and grocery stores and everybody else that wanted to buy them, but they couldn't get them. And especially in quantities. So I was able to get them in quantity because I, I hustled to you know deal with everybody. And they would actually pay me almost the same price they'd sell for. They would pay me, you know, whatever it is that I, I needed for it. This is not really 1997, 98, because stuff was crazy, but 99, 2000, they, the prices came down some. 
but they would pay me basically what they would sell them for and maybe a dollar less and would buy thousands, tens of thousands at a time, put them in their store. They could advertise it. People will come in their store and get it and they can't get it direct from Thai. And uh, that really boosted those, those store sales. So crazy. That's, that's, it went from being super limited to the crazy high prices, not as limited, but quantity was still hard to get. And I was able to get quantity at a good price and then eventually just sell to all the stores that couldn't get them that were big stores. And that, that's how, you know, I made a lot of money. I, I love it. So I, I was just curious because I didn't know, I didn't know any of that about Beanie Baby. So it's cool to hear, mm -hmm. but so keep going with your story. So what, so then. So Beanie, Beanie Babies, Babies. so Beanie eventually... Babies, by the way, a fun fact. So I have three kids and of course I have a, my wife. I met, I met in 1997. The way I met my wife was I was going to a store to buy Beanie Babies and she worked at one of these stores that would actually sell me Beanie Babies through the back door and I'd pay her, you know, extra. And so we started going out and then, you know, eventually we got married and we have three kids. My oldest kid is named Ty because of Ty Beanie Babies. So, mm -hmm. you know, Beanie Babies were Ty Beanie Babies. So we named, I named him Ty because that's why I met my wife. That's how, you know, he came about. So I actually named all my kids after different businesses I have. But Love since it. we're talking about Beanie Babies, I was telling you my oldest kid is Ty from, because they're called Ty Beanie Babies. But Beanie Babies lasted a good six years, seven years, and they kind of died out. And as, Can as we talk we about that for a second? Sorry. This is something that's interesting to me that I feel is because you've been in the game so long. I've been in business at three years. I started in the, at the beginning of the pandemic in real estate, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm curious about is it sounds, you know, when you should put a business to pasture too, right? Like eventually what, when do you do that? How, because I think people get emotionally attached to their businesses mm -hmm. a little bit of, this is how I made so much money. Why isn't it working anymore? What do I do now? Right. And so how does one pivot when the market's changing, especially the real estate or with business in general? When do you take a business out to pasture and how do you make those types of decisions? So you got to have a lot of good common sense and you, you can't fight what's happening. So, you know, you see trends, you see that you're doing well, you know, anyone that's a good business person has, you know, accounting and, and P and L's profit and loss statements. You look at it and you see, look, my sales are going up. It's a crazy good business. It, it's steady. You know, I need to do more marketing. It's going down. Maybe the business is not doing as well. And you look at these trends from month to month, year to year. And, you know, you know, you, you should be able to tell that the business is going the right way or wrong way. As soon as you start seeing it dipping, then you got to start making plans of, okay, how do I either sell it before it's worthless or how do I find something else? So when it goes down and not put too much more money into it. And, you know, again, it's just, you gotta be smart and have good, good, you know, just good tendencies and, and good instincts, but you gotta also look at this stuff and to be able to tell. But eventually, yeah, Beanie Babies went uh, up. So during this time of Beanie Babies, during this time really of baseball cards, the, the transition when I was still doing baseball cards, I was making all this money and I had, I said, a million dollars in my bank account by 19, my early 20s, even a lot more. And I had another friend, right? You could call him a mentor, I guess. He was 20 years older than me. And he's, look, I have, you know, a bunch of real estate. I do really well. It's passive. I get a lot of rentals. He's, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about selling a couple. Yeah, I could give you a deal if you want to buy some. I was all right, show me how you do it. So he sold me a couple, a couple properties and I rented and I rented them out and did pretty well with them. And uh, I kind of got addicted to it because you know you have that three, four, five hundred dollar cash flow every single month. The properties go up in value. And so I started buying more. And then eventually the way I was buying them all was just putting down, you know, 20% at the time and getting a loan for the rest. And then eventually I got into buying some stuff sub two. I got into some owner finance deals and I was holy crap. So I, I, during this time I was doing business, I was always passively doing some real estate. And I was like, so that's kind of how real. So when I got into Beanie Babies, I basically had a lot of property as well. A lot of rentals. And the hmm. first two or three I had, I managed myself and I was like, fuck this. I don't get, and then I just hired a property manager that I still have to this day that manages, a, you know, 200 some properties for me right now. Nice. But so that's kind of how, how real estate transitioned. Plus they were telling me about how I could, you know, I was showing on how much taxes I was paying every year and uh, look, you could get a good tax write off, you get good, you know, and if you want to build your wealth long-term, if you own all these properties in 20, 30 years, they're going to be paid off and you're going to have millions and millions of dollars worth of properties. And actually I still own today properties that I bought in 1998, 1999, 2000. I still have properties that I own from those, from those years. And the ones that I got loans on are mostly paid off. I'm 20 something years in 
to the amateurization right. of 30 years. So I have five, six years left on a lot of properties. But, you know, then I started making stupid money later on in life and I was just paying cash for properties. So I have, you know, a hundred and some properties that I, I pay cash for. So I don't even have loans on them. And then those, those Okay, are- so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the stupid money for a second. What What is stupid money and how did that happen? So, so again, having a good network, we didn't talk about this, but having a good network of people around you is really important. So when I was in business and when I was in baseball cars and Beanie Babies, I started dealing with a lot of different people and a lot of different people thought the same way as me. They're like, oh, look, let's find these really hot businesses. Let's get into Beanie Babies. Let's get into the next hot thing. And there was all these different hot things that were, you know, Power Rangers and Pogs and different video games that were really hot that we would do, you know, as they got hot, but they lasted, you know, maybe Christmas season or, or six months or a year. And we kept getting into all these different things. And what we'd do is... I would buy and sell B babies to different people or baseball cards, and they would tell me what they're doing good with. I would tell them what I'm doing good with, and we would share information. A lot of my these people were in different states, and they're look, I'm killing it in this, and I would tell them I'm killing it in this, and then we would help each other. So I got into a lot of things because of other people that were in my network, and they made a lot of money off me by me telling them what I'm doing really good at. So there's different different things that we we, we shared, but one of the particular things. So I, I I've always made a lot of money, you know really for my age, but definitely in my twenties, my thirties, I was making a lot. And, you know, I made my first 10 million in Beanie Babies and I actually had that saved in my bank account. So it wasn't like I made 10 million. I, I really had 10 million. And then from there, one of the people that I was doing a lot of business with in Beanie Babies in New Jersey, I was, look, I am getting into, I just started doing this gold stuff, jewelry. I knew nothing about jewelry, by the way. I knew nothing. And he's, man, you got to get into it. Gold just went from 300 an ounce to 700 an ounce in the last you know short period of time and you're able to buy this stuff and just make crazy money and i'm still making a lot of money on at this point it's not beanie babies anymore it's something called webkins it's another stuffed animal that was crazy hot there's two animal stuffed animals that were crazy hot beanie babies back in the late 90s early 2000s and then webkins in the mid 2000s so webkins became really popular in 2006 7 8 9 gotcha and that's when i was doing webkins and this guy came to me he's look you got to get into, into, into gold. And this is 2006, 2007. And I was like, I don't know anything about it. He's like, oh, just trust me. And I'm like, I'm making too much money on weapons because I was making crazy money on weapons just for being babies. And eventually, weapons started slowing down. He was making a lot more money in gold. He kept bugging me. I, was like, I flew up to, to him in New Jersey and I watched him set up and how he was buying this gold. And I'm like, holy shit, if people were just selling him gold, literally, at 25 to 35% of what it was worth. So he'd buy $1,000 worth of gold for $300. Um, holy mm-hmm. shit. And he could just sell it the next day. So it, it was just easy the way he did it. So I was like, fuck, I got to learn how to do this. So I hung out with him for a week. We, I learned it from him. And then I came back and started opening up a gold stores all over the place. I was actually the first one in the country that ever opened the We Buy Gold store. I was the first one, 2007. Wow. That's 2000, crazy. 2007. So there was a cash for gold where you mail, you mail your gold in. I think they started maybe 2006 or something, maybe even before that. And then there's, of course, there's jewelry stores and pawn shops and all that stuff that bought gold. But there was nobody in the country in 2006 that had a store that all they did was buy gold. Nothing else. They didn't sell anything. They didn't do anything. They just had a We Buy Gold sign. And so I, I started that. And I, I opened up two stores and they just made $25,000, $30,000 a month in profit each. I was like, holy shit, I opened up five stores and I opened up 12. And before you knew it, I had 300 stores throughout the country. And that was the, the business that I made fuck you money. That was the business that was crazy. So I had, I had some partners and stuff because that's how we were able to grow all over the country. But we made over $100 million in profit in you know, a short period of time. With, with, so I had so much money and I didn't know what to do with it. I literally had every single month, I, I had another thousand, two thousand, I mean, another million, two million dollars in my bank account extra every month. I was like, fuck. I, and I was so busy with gold. And you know, I got into jewelry. I got into all kinds of other, other stuff that was, you know, in that industry, uh, coins and, you know, whatever. But so at this point, the market crashed, the, the, the real estate market crashed, right? 2007, eight, nine, 10. I remember, went to shit. So I had another friend, the one that taught me about real estate in the beginning, who mainly only really does real estate, a little bit of business. And look, the market just dropped. Homes that were selling for 200,000 are selling for 25,000 right now. It makes no fucking sense. And nobody could buy them. Nobody has any, you know, you can't get a loan and you have to pay cash. He's like, why don't you give me a few million bucks, bucks and I'll just start buying every house at, at, at the auction. And he's like, dude, this doesn't make any sense. They're going for like 10, 15% of what they went for the year before, two years before. He's, I've been, this guy is 20 years older than me. 
And he's, I've been in the real estate business for 40 some years. This has never happened. And it does happen every 10 years in some sort of cycle, but not this low. And he's, you know what? The rents are basically the same as what they've been before. You just can't sell the properties, right? There's no buyers for properties because you can't get loans, but you can rent them. Everybody needs a house to rent. So I just bought hundreds of homes with this guy. I gave wow. him the money. I gave, it was all my money. I basically lent him. We were 50, 50 partners. I lent him half the money. So let's say I gave him 3 million bucks. I'm like, you owe me interest on a million and a half, a million and a half is mine. We're going to buy the properties together. You're going to be the one in charge of buying them, managing them, everything. And we'll just own them together. And I didn't have time to do it. So I just gave him. So back in 2010, 11, 12, I bought hundreds of properties and for 10, 10 15% on, on, on the dollar. Over, over the next four or five years, I sold a lot of them for double what I paid or whatever. Now there were 10 times what I paid and I still have a bunch of them luckily, but um, so that, that I just, and I just kept giving them more money and we just kept buying stuff. And then every single year it went up a little bit, we'd sell some, and, but we made a ton of money because we were renting them all for, you know, for crazy money. Literally we would pay 30,000 for a house and we were getting a thousand, you know, a month rent. So in 30 months, yeah. we had the house for free, you know? Right. Um, and, and now those houses are worth 300,000 that we paid 30,000 for. So it's, right. it's crazy. But yeah, that, that's kind of the journey. And, and then in this gold, so business, you're making it sound pretty dang easy. Let me just say it was, it right it now. Was that it was that I bad. love it. My man, I appreciate you so much for coming on this podcast. That was super enlightening about businesses, about partnerships, all of that. So what can my community do for you? The regular viewers of Scorch of Fears. What I do you want? Say, to, uh, yeah. I was going to say, don't be fearful. Just reach out. <laughs> well, uh, for sure but what are you looking what do you want do you it sounds yeah. you want more deals is there anywhere you want deal. deals is there something else someone can give you what are you looking for right now i'm always looking for more deals i actually went to an event a year ago and i was talking to pace and pace is like, all right i'm gonna go around the room ask everybody what they want what they need what they want what they need and i'll be the only thing i want i want more deals i want more deals and then we started doing a lot more deals together because of that but yeah i mean more deals i i mean that's really what the area for the deals yeah. I mean, I don't care what the deal is. I don't care if you need like transactional funding, you have properties to sell, you, you want to buy stuff. I mean, I sell stuff, I buy stuff. I, it's just fun, but yeah. Any, any, that's so just send it anywhere, anywhere in the, in the U S just as long as the ARV percentages. Make yeah. So sense. I only buy cash. cash deals. I buy cash deals only in the Atlanta markets, an hour of okay. Atlanta, I buy cash. but creative deals, every single, everywhere. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. My man. Well, I appreciate oh, the other thing you. I want from everybody is I want everybody to, to follow me on definitely YouTube, subscribe, watch some of my videos. Cause that's what I'm trying it's to just do. Just your name. So my, yeah, it's just my name, Abraham Gray. That's my biggest thing that I'm trying to do. And I, I want to see if I, uh, I was talking to Pace and Pace is growing at exp exponential. Uh, I, I told Pace, my goal is to get to where I'm, I could, I could stay at 10% of what he's at. So whatever number he's at, I want to get to 10%. If I can get to 10%. That would be amazing. He's like, oh, you're going to get way past 10%. Dude, you're growing fucking fat no matter how much you grow. You've got a pretty unique sales pitch, though. Yeah. You're right. I don't know anyone who's talking about buying businesses on no. YouTube. I think you've got a niche where you could explode even more than Pace because Pace's thing is creative financing with real estate, which is really niche niche. While buying businesses, I feel there's a huge, I think there's a bigger market for it, to be honest. Nobody um, knows about it, though. It's, 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 people don't know about it, so it's not... The, the, it's a smaller niche because nobody knows about it. So What's, really is crazy. your Instagram, your name too? I think it is, right? Yeah, it's, it's Abraham Gray official. Cool. All right. I'm just, I'm just making sure guys follow him. Good stuff. Follow him on Instagram, follow him on YouTube. If you've got deals, send it to him on his Instagram. People can send you deals on Instagram. Yeah. I'm, I'm more of a Facebook person, but email okay, or message him on I, Facebook. E email is where I want all the deals sent. So my email, What's your email? is Abraham, my name. And then at. And then it's MMA Mixed Martial Arts and ATLAtlanta.com. So Abraham at MMA ATL.com. I have a bunch of gyms. I used to I fight it. a little bit amateur, so that's how I have MMA ATL. Nice. I do I do jujitsu. I'm a white belt, so I'm not great. But oh, I'll I, fucking I smack you. I'm I've been doing jujitsu for I've been doing jujitsu for over eleven years. Yeah, I believe it. That <laughs> MMA ATL? Yeah. Awesome. Cool, my man. I appreciate you. This has been super fun. I learned a lot. Is there any any last words for the audience? Anything like that? No. Everyone should get into jujitsu. How do you like jujitsu? 
I love it so much. I mean, I've done boxing and yeah. I've done other martial arts throughout my entire life. But jujitsu, what I love about jujitsu is I can go all out and it's not, you can't go all out in boxing ever, yeah. really. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you're hurting people. You can't do right, it. Jujitsu, right. you can actually go hard, as hard as you can. And uh -huh. then, like, you're people like, better than you, no matter how hard you go against them, it's nothing. It doesn't matter. Right. So, I, I the first time I went against a black belt, I was wow. I went against a black a black belt who was a I think she was a hundred twenty pound girl, and I'm wow. I can't yeah. believe how bad I am. Crazy, like, yes, holy crazy. Jesus. So if you keep doing jujitsu, man, you're gonna have the best friends. You're gonna be yeah, pretty always cool. healthy, feel good about yourself. You know, sweat. So yeah, it's it's the best environment. It's it's great to be. I love it. It's cool for time. Don't be fearful to start jujitsu. It's worth doing. Don't be fearful of anything, guys. That's why we're here. It's Scorch the Fears. Abraham, my man, any last words for the audience before I end this out? Yeah, I just want to say anyone that's got to the end of this and watched the whole thing, holy shit, you guys rock. It's, that was pretty long. So hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed it. And I can't wait to work with you guys, do some deals with you in the future. 100% man. I appreciate you. I'm going to be sending you some deals that I I might want to I might want to partner up with you on some stuff too. So awesome. we're going to 100% yeah. make it happen. Guys, that's Scorch the Fears. Next week we've got Marco Rivera talking about social media. I appreciate all of you guys so much. Abraham, thank you again. Let's freaking go.